next Friday. Congressman Steny Hoyer is, of course, the House Democratic Whip. Good to see you, Congressman. Thanks so much. Uh, Good to be with well, you, Andrew. Another showdown here. Um, uh, Eric Cantor saying that the president isn't showing leadership. I think you have a, a different point of view on that. What have no, you said? Yes, you're right, of course. Uh, first of all, let me say there were uh, two offers. The president made an, an offer of what he thought the budget for next year ought to look like. That was the 2011 budget. Uh, that he submitted. Uh, the Republicans said we want to cut that $102 billion or $100 billion. Uh, we have now offered, and the Senate will be considering, an offer of $51 billion in cuts uh, based upon the same base that the Republicans are using. So we're comparing apples to apples. Uh, so that to say that the, the Democrats haven't gone at least halfway, a little more than halfway, uh, is incorrect. Uh, the fact is that we now, uh, after the Senate vote, we'll see what the Republicans counter offer uh, to the Senate offer is. But the bottom line is the American people want to see this issue resolved. They want to see the government uh, kept open. They want to keep uh, uh, the services there that they rely on uh, coming. Uh, they certainly want cuts. We want cuts. But as David Brooks said, those cuts ought to come after thorough analysis and careful consideration of priorities. That happened yet. But I am very hopeful, and I will be talking to Mr. Cantor uh, after the Senate votes to see uh, whether or not we can uh, reach a compromise that will be acceptable to both sides and we can move forward. The real issue, Andrea, is going to be uh, over the next seven months, as they give thoughtful consideration, as they have uh, the appropriation hearings uh, to see what they're going to propose in terms of in investing in our future uh, and making sure that we have the services we need while cutting smartly and effectively to bring this deficit down. Uh, you've got uh, on the Senate side, West Virginia, new Democrat Joe Manchin, former governor. He's been pressing the president to get more directly involved and actually uh, some say going rogue with his criticisms of the Democrats. Well, let me say this, Andrea. Uh, my view is I talked to Bill Dale yesterday, uh, and uh, I, the White House is involved. Gene Sperling is involved. Jack Lew is involved. Uh, and they've met with the Republicans. They continue to talk with Republicans and Democrats. It's clear that the White House, uh, the House, and the and the Senate need to work together to resolve this impasse and, and address the, the upcoming uh, uh, fiscal year 2012, resolve 2011, uh, and make sure the government doesn't shut down. And the Republicans in the election talked a lot about certainty, that uncertainty was disquieting uh, and destabilizing for our economy. I agree with them on that. Uh, but this uh, inability to uh, come to compromise, to reach uh, agreement, uh, to fund government for this year and then address uh, next year's uh, government is irresponsible and destabilizing and adds to uncertainty. Uh, I'm hopeful that we will be able to reach agreement. And as I say, I want to reiterate, uh, the, uh, in September, the Republicans said they wanted to cut $100 billion from Obama's uh, budget, President Obama's budget. We have now, uh, in the Senate, offered $51 billion of those cuts towards that $100 billion. Uh, so we've come more than halfway. We are hopeful that the Republicans, who have not moved off their position, will now make a, uh, a counteroffer as to what they think uh, uh, their members will support. I want to ask you briefly about the NPR controversy because the, the CEO has quit under fire. There was a sting, a video. Uh, we know, you know, the, the controversy over how some of these stings are done, especially by this man, O'Keefe. But at the same time, do you have a problem now with trying to defend NPR? I mean, we're talking about pennies on the budget. So this isn't really a, a cost-saving move, but now it's become so politically fired up. And what's gotten lost in this is the fact that National Public Radio journalists are you know, in the war, in war zones all over the world, and particularly in the Middle East, that nobody is suggesting that their journalism has been at all biased. But you've got Andrea, the, you've got an executive, I, I, a fundraiser who isn't even involved in the journalism, is now making it even more difficult. Yeah, I, I agree with your uh, uh, premise that uh, NPR and its uh, its reporters, its journalists, uh, provide an excellent service to the American people and indeed to the international community in terms of the. Uh, news and information that they are able to gather uh, and to transmit to the uh, American people and to the international community. Uh, 
obviously, uh, every organization has uh, uh, within its ranks some people who make mistakes and, and who say things that are clearly not justifiable, um, paint with a very broad brush, and are inaccurate because of that broad brush uh, uh, nature. I think the proper action was taken, but it should not affect the debate with reference to the importance of uh, having uh, the National Public Radio and its affiliates, uh, CPB as well, uh, giving the kind of information and unbiased view that I think that they give uh, on the uh, state of affairs in our country and around the world. And before I let you go, you've both been in Washington a long time, and um, we've seen many people come and go, but just moments ago we had very sad news for those of us in journalism that David Broder, the dean of all journalists in Washington, who really defined political coverage at 81 years old, has died. Uh, the Washington Post now confirming that report. Um, I'd like to give you a moment, Steny, to talk about what David Broder has meant to all of us. Well, and Andrea, uh, I agree with you. David Broder was one of the greats uh, of this country, the fourth estate in journalism. Uh, I remember I was elected to the state senate a long time ago, over 40 years ago. I can remember David Broder being at that point in time, uh, even at that age, half his age, uh, being uh, someone who was respected, uh, read widely, uh, and uh, made a real impact on people's thinking. Uh, and uh, certainly gave them an insight into politics and public policy and, and what was going on in our country. David Broder will be sorely missed. He was one of the great journalists uh, of our time, uh, well respected uh, and, and, and perceived correctly uh, to be even handed in his analysis. Uh, and I think that was one of his great strengths that both uh, across the spectrum, uh, you could read David Broder and know that David Broder was giving you uh, a balanced uh, analysis uh, and reporting of what was going on. And, and David Broder uh, was one of the great journalists of our times and will be sorely missed. Thank you for that, Stanley. I'll have more to say uh, about David, uh, who mentored all of us uh, later in the program. Thanks, Stanley. Thank you, Andrew. And the controversy is heating up today over New York Congressman Peter King's Homeland Security hearing tomorrow.